All right, if you have your Bible, Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, a very familiar passage and um, one we won't avoid this morning. It's uh, not one that you would uh, want to open up and just begin to rejoice, uh, but it's one that has a truth that is uh, profound in our days. We need it. We need to hear this truth. Uh, no one seems to want to talk about it, though. And uh, it's not a uh, comfortable situation to talk about uh, what I'm fixing to talk about, but it is a reality. And uh, God has been so good to you and I that he not only shares uh, the way to heaven through the Lord Jesus, but he also shows the consequences of man uh, if he dies without Christ. And many times we... Uh, Sometimes we take these things for granted, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of others. And uh, I want to look there this morning. Uh, the Lord, Mark chapter 9, and uh, if you would, we'll just, uh, we'll start our reading in verse 42, and we'll just preach uh, textual. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, uh, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is never quenched. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the blessings of God in our life. And Lord, we don't always understand your ways because you told us your ways are not our ways. But Lord, we can trust your ways. We can trust your thoughts. We're grateful for your ways. Use the Bible this day in our lives. Help us, Lord. And I promise you I'll thank you for it. I'll, I'll love you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is talking to a crowd of people, and he begins with children. Isn't that uh, ironic? He, he begins with children, and he says, If anyone offends one of these, my little ones, uh, that believe in me, and what he's saying is this, when you begin to deal with children and the faith of a child, you better be very careful what you do and how we influence it. Now, you and I take this as the matter of uh, someone in a, in a wicked manner uh, trying to change what a child has been taught, uh, and that can be applied to this text, um, but I don't believe that's the depth of the meaning there. The Lord said uh, that if someone would influence, basically, a child not to believe in the faith that has been instilled in their heart, that it'd be better off for them to tile a millstone around their neck and be thrown to the bottom of the sea. Now, I didn't say that, folks. Jesus did. And what he is talking about is the uh, in very importance of instilling the Word of God into the heart of a child before they're an adult. Now, have you ever noticed when he leaves this passage, he leaves this passage and goes straight to the subject of hell. And there's a reason for that. Uh, we better get our children while they're children. We better instill the Word of God in their hearts while they're young. Young children need to be saved. And did you know what? A child believes, a child... Jesus even talks about childlike faith. And uh, so there's a twofold warning here. Number one is this. 
And I think it primarily is placed here not only for uh, the wicked crowd, but also the carnal crowd. Uh, Our children are watching us. Do you know that? Our children watch every move. I read of a a true story of 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 a parade in New York City. You'll have to pull it up. Maybe Google can help you find it. Uh, But there was a parade in New York City, and there was a young man, a young child. I I think he was around five, maybe six. I don't really recall his age. I just read of the story. It's been a while since I read it. Uh, But there was a major parade through New York City, and his daddy was in the parade. And uh, this young this young child was on the side of the uh, with a crowd with his mother and his family and his siblings. And when his daddy came through in the part of the parade that he was in, the little fella got loose from his mother and he ran right in behind his dad to get in behind to follow his dad's footsteps. And the story goes on that he wasn't seen by the crowd and the little fella was mobbed to death. Uh, That's a true story from what I can can come... uh, come up with. I've I've read it. It's been a while. I've got it filed in my office. And what a heart-wrenching story. But the illustration there is this. All he was doing was following his father's footsteps. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. He said children ought to be able to follow us They ought to be able to follow our influence. He said when you and I begin to influence them to turn away from God or not to believe and have faith in the Lord, Jesus said it's better to take a millstone, tie it about one's neck, and let them be cast into the bottom of the sea. Now, I didn't say that. And what he's saying is, When you and I turn one from Christ, there are major consequences that escape our minds sometimes. We don't think like the Lord is preaching here much. Many times you and I, if someone to get out of church or maybe someone uh, is not saved and we see them living a certain way, uh, we don't think much about the complications. Matter of fact, a lot of times we got all the answers for them. Well, if they just do this, if they had just do that, they had, and, and sometimes those things are right. If they would heed to the warnings that we give them, uh, it would help them. But did you realize the consequences for a man, woman, boy, or girl that dies without Christ? And that's what the Lord is homing in on here. He said, listen, don't ever influence a child faith away from me because the consequences are hell. Now look, he's talking about a child, someone who can comprehend the word of God. They know right from wrong. When a child knows right from wrong, that's when the age of accountability comes in. Now I don't know what you were taught when you were little or you were, you were you know, coming up. A lot of our generation, that's my age, Uh, We were taught that uh, it was around 12 years old. I I totally disagree with that. And I'll tell you why I disagree with that. I'm not saying that it doesn't play a role that sometimes it is 12. I'm saying you can't point to a child at all times and say that when they're 12, then they better get to thinking about their soul. And I say that because, primarily because of Dash's age. Dash, uh, he's been sharp since he was just a little fella. And he knows right from wrong. And the, the Lord is teaching you and I, when they get to the age of accountability, you don't have to agree with this, okay? This is what I believe the Bible teaches. I believe the age of accountability could be six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old if, if that child really does understand the Word of God. Uh, now, in the midst of saying all that, The Lord is not talking about their age of accountability. He's talking about the influence that you and I and others have on children. We better be careful what we're teaching our children. And then it almost seems abruptly, he just changes the subject. 
I mean, have you ever read that one? First of all, he's talking about children. He's talking about not, not influencing them the right way. And then he totally changes the subject and goes to a subject that is very uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, we don't understand the Lord, but we're not supposed to have to understand the Lord. We're, to un we're just to obey the Lord. Amen. And he talks here about a subject that we don't want to talk about, uh, but I'm going to this morning. Did you know this morning as we sit here as Christians, and I, and I trust and hope that those, all of us that are here are saved, I hope and pray you are. Uh, boy, God help us if there's someone here that's never truly been saved and they're, they're come and sit under my voice and they're comfortable under my voice. Lord, help me. Uh, but if you're here and you're saved, sometimes we, it, it, it escapes our mind and the reality of hell escapes us May I tell you this much? Hell is real. Hell is as real as heaven is. And there's some major warnings here the Lord tells us about hell. And I want to look at them just for a moment. First of all, I want you to notice this. Jesus, to me, he is highlighting the severe pain that will be in hell. Now, I don't know about you, and, and I, I don't want to bring up any uncomfortable feelings in our heart, but sometimes it's good for us to think of some uncomfortable things when it comes to such a serious matter. I, I can remember in my life of people passing away and dying, and out of all that I can remember, I've never seen anyone suffer pain like my aunt. Uh, my aunt had breast cancer. She had had both breasts removed. And uh, I can remember her body as a young teenager. I, well, I was actually about in my 20s, I believe I was. Now, I was a little older than in the teens. It's been a while. But what I remember, actually, I, I, know, I know I was in, in, in my 20s because I had just begun to have the call to preach on my life. But I remember her body turning a yellow color. It was, it was yellowish and she moaned all day long. Her, uh, she had a, a uh, we used to wear them when we was kids on our arms or we'd wear them sometime around our head, but she had a bandana on her head because all of her hair had come out because of chemo. And uh, she was in chronic, constant pain. I mean, just moaning and, and it, it was horrible folks it was I can remember it what cancer will do and I, I my heart goes out to those that go through cancer the kind of pain that I saw in her life uh, was just it was unbearable it, it, it would sometimes I, I, I can remember this as a young man it, it was very difficult for me to just stay there for any amount of time I would have to leave the room. And uh, so finally, uh, the way they got her out of her pain is they put her on a morphine pump. And uh, they had to con constantly add to that pump. The pain was so severe. And, uh, and eventually, uh, the, the opium uh, took its course. There was so much opium in her body that she went on into eternity and she went out of this world in severe pain. They never, never subsided her pain. Hospice didn't, uh, although they tried to. And I give hospice credit for trying to help those that are in severe pain. There's no indictment against hospice. I think they're a wonderful group of people who really do try to help those that are in severe pain. But in this case, she went out in a lot of pain I've never seen no one in pain like that in all of my life. I'll never forget it. But as I read this passage, Christ highlights the immense pain that will be in hell. And he does it several different ways, in a threefold way. And when he does this, it speaks, if you will, um, in, in a way, a phrenetic way to you and I about how God's going to deal with people. Number one, I want you to notice that the Lord talks about the hands. Do you see that? Uh, he said, uh, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. 
It's better for thee to enter into hell with one hand, basically, than two hands in this life. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever cut yourself? Have you ever, have you ever gouged yourself or, let's just say, bruised yourself? Can you imagine the pain an individual would have if they severed their hand from their wrist? I don't know about you, but that'd be pretty painful. And the Lord is saying here, here's what he's trying to say. Hell is a place filled with pain. Now look, ah, buddy, when I get to hurting, I go to crying. My wife will tell you I'm a big baby. Give me a Tylenol. Give me ibuprofen. I don't like pain. Does anybody here like pain? Pain is when the nerves get out of control and the nerves begin to speak to us about the pain that we're going to. Jesus is highlighting the severe pain that the hand can bring. What is he saying? He's saying if your hand offends thee, cut it off. He is talking about what a man can do or a woman can do with their hands while here on earth whether it's working willingly with their hands, why the Bible said, or doing wickedness with the hands. He's referring to the hands being a way of life, what you do, what you don't do. The hands speak of how we carry ourselves in life, where we go, what we do and what we don't do, how we respond, how we don't respond, how we react, what we do with people. He said, look, if your hand offends you, cut it off. The pain that you would go through while here on this earth will not compare to the pain that's going to be in eternity forever and ever and ever and ever. And may I help you and remind you today of the loved ones in my life and in your life, the things that they do with their hands, the wickedness, how they live. God said they'd be better off to cut their hands off than to die without Christ. Hell is filled with pain this morning. I don't want nobody to die and go to hell. I don't want nobody to die and go to hell. Jesus didn't want nobody to die and go to hell. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. May I tell you this morning... And I, uh, you don't have to raise your hand on this one, but I want you to think along the line with me. It could be a loved one. It could be a friend. It could be someone you used to know or may still know. But if you ever run across a person, you just, they're, they, they kill themselves. They will not do right. They're just not going to do right. And if you're not careful, you and I, we get frustrated with them very quickly. We get frustrated with them. We want to pour, we, we want to shake them. We want to tell them to do right. And we, uh, if we could change their actions, we would. They're working with their hands the wrong things in life. They're doing that which is wrong. I want, I want to share a, a, a text with you that Jesus uh, reveals to you and I in the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, if you have your Bible. And I want you to turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And verse 7. You there? All right, look at this. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Folks, what Paul is saying here, all those people who have lived the way they wanted to, they've done the way they wanted to, they've, they've responded to the gospel the way they wanted to, they've done everything 
contrary to God's word, he's fixing to sum up what's going to happen to these people. And may I say, when you read this, it's alarming. Look at what he says. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, look in verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them, if you have your Bible, please underscore this, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Keep reading, it gets, it gets heartbreaking. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. We, we, don't, we don't think about that much. We only think about what they're doing with their hands and how it affects us. And it does affect innocent people. May I remind you this morning that hell is a place of pain like you can't imagine. And Jesus, Jesus said, look, if these people would do away with their hands because their ways are causing them to go to what they're doing is causing them to go to hell. And if they had just, they'd be better cutting them hands off and not having hands, not being able to do wrong, not being able to defy God, not being able to shun the gospel. They'd be better off with no hands. And then he goes to the feet. See, the hands speak of what we do. The feet speak of where we go. And where we go in the path of this life. And I'm telling you, I don't know how many I've preached to. You preach and they just want to go the wrong way. They, they ought to be in church and they're in the bar. They ought to be in Sunday school and they're in the bed committing fornication and a bunch of wickedness. And they get mad at the preacher because the preacher tells them the truth. You know what Jesus said about those people that are walking those paths, Brother Mark? He said it's better that they just stop in life. It's, it would be best for them to stop in life, take a saw or whatever, and cut their feet off. Because they are going down the wrong path. They're going to a place where the worm dieth not. And, the, and then he, so he speaks to the hands of what we could do. He speaks to the feet where it takes us. And then he homes in on the eyes. Now the eyes are that which we're looking upon. Oh me. And, and, and you can apply this from anything from pornography to a bunch of wicked stuff on TV to whatever man allows to come in his eye gate. It comes in his eye gate, goes through his eye gate, his eyes affect his hands, his eyes affect his feet. And Jesus said, I tell you what, just pluck your eyes out. You'd be, can you imagine of plucking your own eye out? Well, that was a part of a pain. That was a part of suffering. Uh, immense punishment that they would do in the old time. They would pluck the eyes out of people. And to pluck, just, just, just imagine you taking or somebody taking their finger and reaching in your eyeball, grabbing it and yanking it out of socket. Yanking it completely out. He said, it'd be better off if that happened to you if you're going to continue to look and do the things that you look and do. He said, because you don't want to come here. And watch what he says. It's not only a place of, of pain. Pain is one thing. But it doesn't stop there. In other words, he is, he is emphasizing here that the physical pain on, in this life will never be able to compare to the spiritual pain and physical pain in the afterlife, it's going to be literally unbearable. It's going to be that bad. 
And he made the statement, he said, where the worm dieth not. But he says this, and the fire is never quenched. He's talking about the power of hell. There's going to be such a demonic power in hell. This fire that he's talking about is going to have so much power and nobody going to put this fire out, Brother Chuck. It's going to be unbearable. And you know what? We got people going to this place by droves. They can't see what they're doing. They don't understand where they're going. And some of them don't even really care. And did you know what? If you and I are not careful, we get frustrated with these people. May I help us this morning? We ought to be broken over these people. We ought to be broken. Can, I, can you imagine what he is saying here? They have done things their way so long. They have brought so much pain into their own lives. Now they're headed, unless a miracle takes place, they're headed to a place where they're going to be in more pain, in more sorrow, in more heart. I mean, have you ever saw somebody, you look at their life and you say, they're just killing themselves. They don't, they don't realize what they're doing. They're causing all these circumstances, all these things are their own fault. Well, you would think that somebody would, a little, a, 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 you know, eventually you would think that they would learn, but that's not the case. Some people die, and look, when one dies, their, their problems to you and I on this earth, it doesn't affect us no longer, but their problems have really only just begun. He said, where the worm dieth not, what is he saying? What does he mean, where the worm dieth not? He's talking about the power of prolonging pain and hell and torment forever and ever and ever. It's never going to end. There's no parole. There's no day of getting out. And Jesus said, that's where they're headed. Paul said, with an everlasting punishment. They're going there. And did you know what this morning? I wonder how many of those people are tied to you and I, and we're really, to be honest with you, I know they have the Lord, but we're really all they have. I get frustrated with people, and I know you do too. But friend, I want to tell you something. He's talking about pain that does not compare to what can be done on this earth. There's no pain like it. And look, when my aunt died, when she died, I can remember my mother and my grandmother saying this. My granny, Mom B, she said, she looked at me, she said, well, Suge, at least she's not hurting right now. She ain't hurting no more. She's in no more pain. But you know, Brother Mark, I, I kind of feel, I, I, I have some confidence that my, that, is, that was a true statement about my aunt. God settled that because I was a young preacher and I was troubled over her heart. And uh, you don't have to, to believe this, but I was really burdened that she had died and went to hell. I was, I was a broken heart. And I said, oh, Lord, I've been there so many times, and I, I, didn't, I didn't talk with her. I didn't try to help her. Lord, forgive me. And uh, God sealed it to me. I believe in all of my heart she's in heaven. My grandmother told me about her salvation experience when she had gotten saved. And the Lord spoke to my heart out of revelation. There shall be no more sorrow and no more pain. No more pain. God took the pain away. When a Christian dies, the pain goes away. And 
you and I, we gather in the rooms, we're at the funeral home, and we stand beside the casket and we say things like this, well, at least they're not suffering anymore. How do you know that? You don't know that. You're going to tell me that a drunkard died in, in, in addiction to alcohol who dies with cirrhosis of a liver or a dope feed or someone that's in the wrong way. And you know for sure they've never received Christ and they're going to stand by the casket and say their pain is ended. No! Jesus said it hadn't. It's only begun. It's only begun. No wonder the Lord, the Lord wants to encourage you and I to get in church and do what's right and live for God. There's people watching you and I. Children watching us. And what he's saying there, I believe the reason he's tied the children and the millstone to the story of hell, he's saying, Mama, Daddy, you're leading your children right into hell. Living any way you want. Doing what you want with your hands. Walking where you want to go. Looking upon what you want to look at. And the whole time they're following you just like the little fellow followed his dad in that parade. I'll tell you one thing I've learned about children. Nobody will hurt you like your own children. I'm confident of it. I've experienced it. You got one chance in life. We don't get, when it comes to dying, and this, this thing called life, this thing called the grace period, this thing called the, 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 the dispensation of Christianity, we only have it one time. And you're influencing lives and I'm influencing lives. And you have loved ones that have gone the wrong way. They're working, doing the wrong things with their hands. They're looking at the wrong things. They're walking the wrong way. And some of them are in, listen, physical pain as we speak, financial pain. Their life is filled with sorrow here on this earth. And if in there, there's not a miracle involved, if something don't happen, if something doesn't shake and wake them up and get them out of the cesspool of wickedness, more than likely, somebody will be standing beside their casket. Well, they're in no more pain. Lying before sitting there lying to one another before you put them in the ground. They're in no more pain. They're not facing no, nothing now. I, I know it's not a, a message that we want to shout about, but it's so it's so real. No one's talking about it. They just, well, what do I do? I can't change them. Well, I've heard that one and I've said that one. I'll tell you all we can do, and it's a lot. It's a lot. Well, let me ask you a question real quick before I, before I answer this. But how many of you right now, if you'd be honest... There's someone you know and you're frustrated with their ways. And if you had your way, you'd change a lot about them. You would. I'm with you. I don't know what it is, but God says, he talks about brokenness and a contrite heart. In Psalms, he ta God talks about how that 
the genuine care and love for someone in rebellion or someone in harm's way. Somehow or another, when I love the unlovable and I grieve over the sin the unlovable is doing, to the extent that it moves me that I can't, you know, sometimes contain my emotions. Somehow or another, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I ain't got it all figured out. But somehow it rings the bell of heaven. It does. Not as though you could wake God up, but it gets God's attention. When we get on our face in prayer, and agonize for those that we know who are lost. Stand with me if you would. I want to ask you a question. Why no one's looking around. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Brother Marty, if you play something back there just softly, I'd appreciate it. He's finding something. You say... I mean, it's almost like in my mind, I'd like to cut their hand or their feet off because I don't want them to go through no more pain. God hadn't given us that option. He hadn't given us that option. We got one opportunity for them. I wonder this morning, as we were preaching, maybe somebody's on your heart Someone you know that is headed, they're headed the wrong way. And boy, if God doesn't do something, it is not going to be good. They're going to be lying around a casket. That could be the thing. Or it could just get worse and worse that it affects us more. And maybe you're here this morning and, and, and God, the Lord, has, has, has opened your heart to the, to the drastic need in the lives of these people. Paul said, who would be punished with everlasting destruction. And maybe, maybe, just not only be in a small way, but it's like the Holy Spirit of God said, I'm talking to you. I'm trying to get your attention here about the life of this individual. And what are you doing? Maybe just this morning, you'll just slip out from where you're at while he's playing this piano. You come on now if you want to. You'd slip out and you'd come to an old-fashioned altar. And you'd say, God, I can't cut no feet off and pluck no eyes out. I wouldn't want to do that anyway. I know what you're meaning. But if you don't get a hold of this individual, if you don't do something in their life, Lord, if you don't intervene somehow, they're going to hell. They're going to die without you. And all I know to do is weep out to you and cry out to you and ask you, God, please save their heart, save their soul, save them, Lord. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is never quenched. Nothing going to put it out. Nothing going to stop the pain. There'll be no hydros in hell. It won't work. It's receiving the Lord, turning in repentance and faith. Placing your faith and trust in the shed blood of Calvary. Rejoicing in the death, burial, and resurrection of God's Son. Getting it right. Dying right. How many of you say, preacher, before we leave, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. That person you're talking about, you just described someone in my life. Brother Chris, I didn't feel inclined to come this morning, but... I would ask you to join me in prayer for the soul of this individual. They need to be saved. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? God bless your hand. I see your hands, almost everybody, anyone else. 
I know someone that is headed right where you're talking about, preacher. Will you join me in prayer for their soul? They're going to die without Christ, and they're going to wake up in hell, and it's going to be bad, preacher. It's going to be bad. I don't want this for them. Anyone else before we close? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel of Christ. We thank you for the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, the Prince of Heaven, who loved us and gave himself for us. Thank you, Lord, for Calvary. Father, time is running out. It's like a vapor. It's here and gone, and there's coming a day the Savior is going to step off the throne of the universe, and He's going to rapture the church, and He's going to pour His vengeance out. The, the wrath of the Lamb is coming. Thank you, Lord, I'll not have to suffer that. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I'll never know what it means for the wrath of God to abide on my life. Thank you. But Father, there's many that I know that if they died today, they're coming to the place where the worm dieth not and the fire's never quenched. A place of sorrow in hell. I plead with you, please save them. God, do it before it's too late. Wake them up. Spiritually sever that which needs to be severed. And may they turn in repentance and faith toward the Lamb of God. Bless our people. Bless our church. Add to our church, Lord, as you see fit. Help us. Look upon our weakness. Help us, Lord. Bless us throughout this day. And I promise you, we'll love you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Men will be at the back. If you want to leave your tithing offerings with them in the back, I